Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan from interstitiallungdisease.info. In this video, I'd like to go over how to classify interstitial lung disease or ILD. This is a very, very important topic and one I struggle with because actually in the making of this material, this video or audio, if you're listening to this, I was struggling to find a good classification. The reason for that is that some interstitial lung diseases are classified such as the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, but others are not. And it's more down to clinician experience. And there are many, many systems on how to classify interstitial lung disease. So in this video, I'm hoping to cover some of these and to at least give you a good solid grounding on how to proceed when you're making your own classifications. So let's get started. Before I begin though, I need to, you know, you, like with all medical videos you might see online, there is a little bit of a disclaimer. So if you're a patient, if you're looking for medical advice, this is not medical advice. It's for general information only. And the same goes if you're a medical professional looking for information on how to treat your patient, you should definitely use your professional judgment while assessing this information that I'm presenting and double checking for errors at all. Uh, steps of the way. So that being out of the way, and I think that's important to mention, let's get into what I've, I'd like to tell you in this video. So how to classify interstitial lung disease. So basically, first of all, let's begin by saying that interstitial lung disease is an umbrella term. It covers many conditions. Some say it's hundreds of conditions. Now, I find that to be a little bit of an exaggeration. I don't think there are hundreds of interstitial lung diseases, but it does depend a little bit on, you know, clinician experience, how many ILDs you know about, let's say, how big is your repertoire of ILDs that you can treat, let's just say, and then obviously it's a way to emphasize how complex the field is and how difficult it is to classify. And there are many acronyms, there are many potential causes, a lot of unknowns, a lot of environmental causes, familial genetic predispositions, interplay between all kinds of autoimmune conditions. So all these matter when you're trying to classify ILDs. So that's why the complexity is there. And some question even whether ILDs can actually be classified accurately. However, there is a lot of work um, going on for that. And actually, we have come a long way. We have definitions for major ILDs like IPF. We have ways and statements and guidelines on how to actually diagnose IPF and rule out things that might look like IPF but are not and are treated differently. That has allowed uh, for the development of clinical trials in the field. We have the first two approved medications that are effective and are used in clinical practice. We wouldn't have gone uh, to that length if we wouldn't have had accurate definitions of conditions and good enough classifications. But it still remains a little bit of a mystery for some areas of ILD at least. Now, let's begin with a broad classification. So here I would consider these things. So you might want to classify the ILD your patient is suffering from into maybe something related to a connective tissue or autoimmune condition, a CTD. It might be a granulomatous inflammatory condition, such as sarcoidosis. It might be an environmental cause leading to the ILD. So chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis comes to mind here, and which can be caused by a lot of exotic things, um, hot tub lung, you know, bird fanciers lung, etc., etc. But then you could also have a drug induced ILD as a reaction to a medication that was taken by your patient or given for another condition. Then there's the big group of idiopathic. So when we really don't know, we have ruled out some of these causes and we can't really come up with something. So we call it idiopathic, so and which just means undeterminate. And then I would just add something that's a little bit more recently acknowledged and that's the familial interstitial lung diseases, which are basically um, conditions in which there is a strong familial predisposition. Not everyone in the family gets the same ILD. They can have different ILDs, they can even have related conditions such as myelodysplasia, but there is a familial aggregation of some of these. So that might be a familial ILD. And it's important because the prognosis can be different. So it emerges as an entity in itself. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IIPs. So if we go back to this 
previous classification, when we talk about the idiopathic interstitial lung diseases, we sometimes call these idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IIPs. I've left the reference here or in the description. Basically, there is a statement on how to classify these idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. So this subgroup of ILDs, we have a classification which has been published and that's something that's great because we can at least try to put things in their little respective boxes based on some common clinical features. And then this classification is from 2000 and uh, um, apologies, from 2013. And it covers ILDs I, that are idiopathic in nature and divided into three groups. Major IIPs, rare IIPs, and unclassifiable IIPs. So obviously, unclassifiable IIPs, you know, you, we can't find the box. We don't know what the cause is. It doesn't look like anything else we've encountered. We can't really, it doesn't fit the criteria for any of the others. So we just call it unclassifiable. And these are generally cases that might require a lot of workup. They might require a lung biopsy. They might require a lot of things to, to actually determine the best course of action, or we may follow the disease behavior closely. These are strange conditions. But in the realm of major IIPs, so we have major and rare. So major IIPs would be the well-known idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or NSIP. I'm just gonna read these out then respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, or RB-ILD, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, or DIP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or COP, or COP, and acute interstitial pneumonia, or AIP. So these are the major IIPs, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Now, obviously, there's a mouthful here. There's a lot of terms, and it's very confusing because some of these terms, like NSIP, can be used to describe pathological findings or radiological findings. So it makes it very, very difficult sometimes for people who are not working in the field of ILD to actually understand what we're referring to. Are we referring to a pattern or are we referring to a pathological finding? Are we referring to a disease? Generally, if we talk about a disease, we call it idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. That's the disease. If we call the pattern we see on a scan as NSIP, then that's a radiological pattern. It's not necessarily a disease in itself, it could be idiopathic or it could be caused, for example, by a connective tissue disease. Or, for example, we might see on a pathologist's report, NSIP, and that's a pathological finding that meets their own criteria. So this is where it gets a little bit confusing, so this is important to mention. But then, let's just list the two rare idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. So we've talked about the major ones, and then there are two rare ones which are idiopathic lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, or LIP, and then idiopathic pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, or PPFE. So these two are rare IIPs. They go alongside the major IIPs and the unclassifiable IIPs. Now, let's move on a little bit from this because this is probably very, very confusing for many people. And I'd like to move on to a simple clinical classification. And this is one that many ILD physicians use in clinical practice. It's the simplest thing you can do. So if you have an ILD, you have hopefully given it a name by now, but then you want to move on and try to treat your patient. So this is where the clinical classifications are really, really important. So this is where you want to really understand whether your patient's interstitial lung disease is inflammatory predominant or fibrotic predominant, because this has actual treatment implication. This decision is not always that easy. However, if you do manage to classify your condition into one of these groups, it allows you to choose a treatment that's more appropriate. So for example, you would give anti-inflammatory treatments such as corticosteroids to attempt to stabilize or reverse an ILD if the disease is inflammatory. If the disease, if the disease is, however, fibrotic, predominant, the anti-inflammatory treatment will likely not work. Or it could even be detrimental based on results from some trials, such as the Panther IPF study. And in the cases of fibrotic predominant disease, you would want to give antifibrotic treatment. So things like nintedinib or perfenidone, if they are approved for the condition where uh, you are trying to treat. So this is again a little bit tricky. I won't go into this in this video. Obviously, I'll need a separate video for treatment and 
progressive fibrotic ILD and all these things that are very, very important clinically. But making this distinction, inflammatory versus fibrotic, to choose a treatment, anti-inflammatory versus anti-fibrotic, is probably very, very important clinically. There is also then the disease behavior classification, which is based on the same reference that I've put before for the classification of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, or IIPs, and there is a disease behavior classification. And I've put a picture of it. If you're listening to this, I'll try to go over this really quickly. But basically, you're trying to define how the disease behaves over time. So it's, again, another clinical way of classifying the ILD that you're dealing with. Hopefully, you have a name for it. But even if you don't, and it's a little bit uncertain, or you have a working diagnosis, you might be able to determine whether the disease you are dealing with is reversible, self-limited, doesn't really require treatment, just the removal of a cause, whether it's reversible with a risk of progression, where you will try to achieve an initial response quickly, whether you're dealing with a stable residual disease, where you're basically trying to maintain the status, the stability of the ILD, whether the disease is progressive with a potential for stabilization, where you will aim to stabilize the condition with treatment, or the last situation is when you are dealing with a progressive, irreversible condition where you are trying to slow down progression with your treatment. That's the aim of the treatment. Now, obviously, the follow-up strategy will be dependent upon this behavior. So if you have a condition, for example, that is self-limited, reversible, something, for example, that's caused by smoking, such as RBILD, you generally won't require a long-term follow-up. However, for most of the other categories where you have a risk of progression, where you have stable disease, even or when there is obvious progression, slower or faster, depending on the patient, you definitely need long-term observation, which should be for years, really, because it can have an unpredictable course. ILDs can have uh, exacerbations, which really worsen your patient's condition. So these are all really, really important things to keep in mind. Now, obviously, there are some other things to consider. So I've added something from a reference from uh, Professor Athol Wells, who is a really uh, a key opinion leader, leader in the field of ILDs, and he's talking about lumpers versus sl splitters. So this is basically a classification of ILD physicians. What type of physician is treating the condition the patient is having? Is he a lumper or a splitter? And it, there's no right or wrong here, but some pa some clinicians would like to have a more big picture clinical management. They might be satisfied with not having a great name for their condition or very, very nuanced descriptions of their conditions. But if the management works, if the patient feels fine, they are happy with that. And then you have clinicians who are more detail oriented and they try to establish a very nuanced diagnosis and they really feel that there are um, phenotypic differences between the conditions so in that case you probably need to make up your mind what type of clinician you think you might be it's fine if you are both however there are for practical reasons in today's world because we don't have consultations that can last for hours in most hospitals around the world. We have many patients waiting to, to be seen, to be put on treatment, to have an outcome. There are good reasons for lumping, for non-experts especially. So if you're not the top of your field in ILDs, if you are unsure about some of the characteristics of the conditions you are treating, about the nuances, there are very good reasons for lumping. One of them is because we have actually at the moment very few therapeutic options. So, for example, for IPF, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in early 2022, we only have two approved antifibrotic treatments, nintedinib and perfenidone, and that's it. So, for other ILDs, the inflammatory ILDs, for example, if you're dealing with a predominantly inflammatory condition, the first-line therapy is usually some corticosteroid, and then plus minus some second line or steroid sparing immunosuppressant. So therefore, clinically, we would just need to try to determine which of these treatments would be most likely to help our patient and then monitor the disease behavior over time. The other thing would be that we have the progressive fibrotic phenotype. And 
some other forms of pulmonary fibrosis which are not IPF. So we're talking here about non-IPF ILDs, which are progressive, the progressive fibrotic phenotype. Despite anti-inflammatory treatment, for example, if they're inflammatory, you still have progression. And this means that uh, this continues over time. And in some cases, the decline in lung function over time can rival that seen in IPF. So there are good reasons to try to treat these patients with add-on antifibrotics or to replace their anti-inflammatory treatment with antifibrotic treatment. Obviously, some physicians argue that we need more nuance and you know fine-tuning of the treatments, but we have an approved medication for example, nintedanib, that is approved for progressive fibrotic ILD. So some clinicians might consider just giving that uh, to treat their patients. So this is why lumping at this stage of knowledge in ILDs is really quite important. So, you know, it's something you might want to consider, especially if you're running a very busy practice. However, if you're involved in clinical research, if you're doing things that are uh, very, very detailed, you're in a tertiary center, you might want to go for splitting and trying to find actually ways to advance the knowledge of ILDs and their treatments. So I hope this um, material, if you've listened to it in audio format or if you've seen the video, was helpful to you. I've left some references in the description and on this slide if you're watching this and hopefully these will be useful for you to get more information about this topic about how to classify interstitial lung diseases. It's a very complex uh, area of medicine but it can be understood with patience. So hopefully you found this helpful and I'll see you in future videos, uh, audios, podcasts, or on the website interstitiallungdisease.info. See you later. All the best.